Wow, look at everybody in this house today. Just look around. Isn't it great to see people in the house of the Lord today? Just excited. Super Bowl Sunday. Who really cares, right? <laughs> Who really cares? But uh, anyhow, we're going to try to go along with it as if we really care. We got a bag of Fritos at home. We're going to watch the game, at least part of it. And uh, intercede for Peyton Manning that he can have at least one more good game. Do I have any Panther fans in the house? I had one until she heard that boo and then she went like this, I don't know. All right, we're good with one Panther fan, that's all right. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer and uh, let's ask God just to move in our hearts today. Heavenly Father, we just love you. We thank you, God. We thank you we can have just a good time with uh, being together, gathering in the name of the Lord. And I pray, Lord, that this morning you would just, uh, again, just lift every burden off of people's hearts and lives. Let the joy of the Lord rule and reign in every life in every way. We thank you for the beautiful time of worship and praise. We thank you, Lord, even for the incredible opportunity to give towards your kingdom and to be a partner and to be a person marked by your grace. And I pray, Lord, that as we just now open the word of God, that you would teach us and lead us even closer to you and make us even bolder in our faith and in our walk. And Lord, we will just give you praise. Even as we come to the place of water baptism, Lord, may this house be filled with celebration, celebrating people's lives who have made a decision to follow in faith after Jesus, our Lord and our King. And we just give you praise, God, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Give somebody a big Super Bowl high five and say, get ready because God's got some big things for you this morning. And uh, then you can be seated today. We're gonna get right into the things of God. I want to just uh, remind you of our, you saw a video announcement for it, but I want to make sure that you're getting uh, some of these cards in your hands. These are cards that our ushers have and they're out our information booth. We are just a few weeks away from our Inspire Conference and we just took 27 men down to Los Angeles the last couple of days and uh, we went to Tommy Barnett's Dream Conference and there was a couple of reasons to go. One was just to have our hearts obviously stirred and for God to, to birth new things in us as we're moving forward as a group here at Eastridge. But the other thing is to even inspire our people with what God is doing through our church. And I'll just tell you the truth, the, the Barnetts have for 30 some years put on one of the finest conferences on ministry that anyone has ever done. And uh, the second thing I would say to you is on March 10th, we're gonna have our One Day Inspire Conference right here. We call it a one day because there's one day that is a complete full day of ministry. But we want you to also get the ninth on your calendar as well. That's Wednesday night because Matthew Barnett, the head of the pastor of the Dream Center, is going to be with us preaching right here. And then the next day, the 10th, is an all-day conference. Starts in the morning and goes all the way into the evening. And uh, Matthew will be there with us as well. But Banning Liebscher, who is the head of Jesus Culture, one of the incredible movements in the world today is Jesus Culture. There's Hillsong. Uh, and there's Bethel music and there's Jesus culture, really creating the music that the world is worshiping to. And uh, they're having their own uh, conferences that they put on to inspire people in worship and they're filling small arenas. So it's an incredible opportunity. If it wasn't for personal relationship, we really probably wouldn't even be able to have Banning come to us as a church and minister like he is. So it's an incredible opportunity for us. I hope you'll catch that vision and that uh, you will put this time on your calendar and join us. And our One Day Inspire Conference, to be honest with you, is going to be beyond, I think, what anybody else is even doing in the country. And I don't mean to say that in a proud or boastful way for our church. I'm just saying that is a reality. And you go to these other conferences and a lot of times they're charging you $250 a person to come to these conferences. And the truth is the people that we have that are coming to, to share and to minister are, are beyond anything else you're gonna find anywhere in the country. And you know how much we're charging people? We put, up to, we put together a box lunch and we're asking you to pretty much cover your, how many think that's a good thing? Cover your lunch. And, and I want you to see what this, what this conference is all about. Because I think sometimes it's just too, too easy to say, well, that's for everybody else. 
This conference is what's so unique about it. You need to think about it in one terms of a spiritual explosion into your life. That's what you need to look at this as because it is a combination of bringing in some of the leading pastors. And what our vision is, is to pull back the curtain and let you really see what ministry is about. For too many people, church is too easy. How many know what I'm talking about? I mean, you drive into the parking lot, you walk in the front door, some incredible people smile, greet you, love on you. You come in, find a seat. Somebody's up here playing good music for you. A few minutes later, we pray. We pray over your needs. Somebody speaks, and then we go home. It's like, how hard is that? You know, how hard is that? And yet, the truth is, the ministry of the church is just being you know, interwoven into our community. We are partners with our community. We're, we're partnering at a level that you need to know about. Uh, we're not only that, but we're so many different aspects of people's lives. What's going on underneath the waterline? Sunday morning church is just the very tip of the iceberg. And uh, I was sharing with some of the guys this morning about even when I had graduated from uh, ministry college and, and um, at Northwest and I was on staff, Cheryl and I were on staff, as non-paid junior high directors at Cedar Park Church. And we went to our pastor, Joe Feet, and we said, well, now's our turn. It's time for us to go, go out and, and serve the church. And uh, Pastor Feet said to me, you know, that's not really how it works, because I was gonna go out and be an evangelist. He said, it's not how it works. You need to pray for the Lord to give you a position in the church so you can understand the church, so you can minister to the church. I said, Pastor Joe, what are you talking about? I've been in church all my life. Some of my earliest memories are sitting on a pew in the church and asking myself a question, how long or how old will I be when my feet can touch the ground? I mean, I was raised in church. I mean, on Wednesday nights, my mom after church was in the choir for choir practice. I was a commando with some of my buddies underneath the pews and, you know, doing the best. We, you know what I'm talking about, some of you who were raised in church. And I was like, all of my life I've been in church. Joe, Pastor Joe, I, I've been serving you as a, as a non-paid junior high leader. How can you say I don't know the church? And he looked at me as only a, a senior seasoned pastor could, and he said, I hate to break it to you, but you don't know anything. <laughs> and when I finally got into a position in the church, I learned he was absolutely right. There was a whole nother world of what ministry is really built upon that I had no visibility to. I didn't even know it existed and, uh, and what we're trying to do is build up strong believers in Jesus who can live the most powerful life you could live and serve. And is, that an, is there an amen in that? Is there a Gatorade coming here somewhere? You know, that you could be the boldest, strongest person living your calling that you could ever be. That's what it's about. And we're bringing in some incredible business leaders, right, most of them right out of our own church. And they are, they are out there on the top tier of leadership and they're going to talk about the practical aspects of merging our Christian faith and our careers and our lives. And you're going to be equipped and you're going to be blown away. And then in the evenings, we're going to have, we want you out here. Why don't you make them plans right now, March uh, 9th, that Wednesday night. And uh, Matthew will be preaching. We want to fill the house. And then on, on the next night, the, thir the Thursday, the 10th, think about this. That's going to be our sixth anniversary. That March 10th is the day we moved into this building. And uh, so that night will be an incredible night, and Benny Liebscher of Jesus Culture will be here preaching, and he's bringing one of his worship leaders from Jesus Culture, and uh, Derek Johnson's going to be with us. So let me see, the, let me see some hands of people who say, you know what, I won't miss what God's going to do on those days. Thank you. i got about 30% of you. Let me just give you one more try. How many of you would say, I'm going to get this on my calendar, and I'm going to be faithful to what God wants to do in our church and through our church? All right, thank you. I have a video camera catching all of your images today, and I'm going to look for you. I just want to tell you what's happening. Think about this. We've invited other churches the last couple of years to come and join us, and they themselves will tell you this is one of the most impactful days for their church leadership, and they're coming back again. One church that the last couple of years has brought like six or seven leaders gave a, a heads up a couple of days ago. And they said, we're bringing 43 leaders. So I, I think that we as Eastridge need to, come on somebody, we need to elevate our faith. I think I ought to have you stand and pray one more time. No, I'm just teasing. But, you know, we need to elevate our faith and we need to believe for the seeds that God wants to sow through our church into this generation. Are you with me?
and let's believe for great, great things. All right, if you have your Bibles, we're in Ephesians chapter 3, and we're going to pick up the story. You know, we've been talking about how the Apostle Paul was in the city of Rome. He was under house arrest, and he was... Uh, used by God, anointed by the Holy Spirit, under house arrest to pen a letter to the city, back to Ephesus, and to the church that he'd helped plant. And this church that he loved so deeply, he had been there for three years, planting and pouring his life into these people. And I think it's also interesting how we've been talking about how, if you really were to look at it, that there's such a correlation between where Ephesus was 2,000 years ago and where the Seattle region is today. And we've talked about this, but I want this to just continually get down deep inside of you. The the thing about Ephesus was it was a crossroads. It was where land travel met the sea. It was one of the major seaports. And that's what Paul loved about it. He loved preaching into strategic places. But not only was it a seaport, not only was it a wealthy, prosperous city, one of the leading cities of the entire first century, but it was also a city that was inundated with false religion. They had the temple to Artemis, one of the seven wonders of the world. And so there was all this stuff that was going on. Wealth, prosperity, travel, transit, trade, all of these things, and yet great spiritual darkness. Sounds a lot like Seattle, doesn't it? A lot of spiritual darkness in the midst of things. You know, it's interesting because we've been hearing from people with, with uh, different organizations and people saying that they're pulling back a little bit on their consideration of coming to Seattle for some of their events and their conferences because uh, they're, they're not comfortable with our downtown area with people smoking pot openly and a lot of the different things that are happening. It's really crazy the environment that we are creating and that we are accepting in our culture. And I don't think we've even understood the long-term ramifications of some of the decisions that we're making in the Seattle region right now. But put all that aside, uh, what I want you to see is this correlation between wealth, prosperity, spiritual darkness, spiritual confusion, and, and that setting. That is so much like the city of Ephesus. And then I want you to see the Apostle Paul. And you know what? On Super Bowl Sunday, it's kind of interesting to talk about the Apostle Paul because the Apostle Paul was a huge sports fan. And it's kind of interesting. I was sharing with our Saturday night crowd. I said, you know, uh, the Apostle Paul talks in the book of Philippians about how he knows what it is to be a base. You know what it is to be a base. That's when you have nothing. You're, you're living under s- severe circumstances, dire circumstances. But he said, I, I not only know how to be a base, I also know what it is to abound. And I think this is just so true. Us and, you know, people in ministry in different places like the Apostle Paul Uh, there would have been times when God was requiring for him to just sacrifice. We know about his imprisonment in Caesarea. We're talking about his imprisonment under house arrest in Rome. And uh, we know a lot of things. He suffered. He was beaten. He was bloody. At one point, he was stoned and left for dead. But you know what? On other days, he was in different environments. He was in different situations. And there were some places where he would have been meeting with kings, leaders, and he would have been treated at the highest level of respect. So he knew both sides of the coin for the sake of the kingdom. And you know what he said? I could do all things through Christ who gives me strength. In other words, he said, I can flow in the place where it's pressure. I can flow in the place where there's damage. And I can also move and flow in other environments and other situations. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Pretty amazing because he was a sports fan. In fact, let me give you a few scriptures. What Paul loved to do um, was he loved to use scripture, or I should say he loved to use even sports to bring illustrations into spiritual things. Let me give you a couple of examples. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24 through 27, he said this, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? And what was his coaching advice? Run to get the win, run to get the prize. In other words, he was saying, don't just be in the race, be in it to win. How many believe God wants us to be in this race to win? Think about how we call this thing our human life. What do we call it? We call it the human race. You know? And just I want you just to think about being in the human race and running this experience to win. Not running this experience just to be a part, but running it to really win. To be who God wants us to be. To live his, his precepts. To be honorable to God. To be pleasing to God. That one day when we rise up and we're, we're there before the Lord, we're at that Bema seat. Remember what that is? That elevated place where the Lord himself comes and rewards the those people who have lived faithfully and honorably unto God. That's what you and I really want. We want to be at the Bema seat, being rewarded for a faithful life. Another scripture the Apostle Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, he said this, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. 
I have kept the faith. That's what it's all about. The race that is to be won is the, is the race of faith. When he says, I have fought the good fight, what he's talking about is not that he was just a brawler, but that he was one who fought the good fight. He was fighting on behalf of faith. He was fighting on behalf of the good things and the kingdom and morality and the things that elevate lives and glorify God. I'm gonna ask you a question. Are you engaged in the right battle today? Are you fighting the good fight on behalf of the kingdom of God? I wanna challenge you. It ought to be what every one of us are leaning into as the family of God and the believers of Jesus, that our lives could be used by God for such a day, such a time as this. Is there a little amen somewhere in the house today? The apostle also said in Philippians chapter 3 verse 14, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So over and over you see this emphasis on being victorious, this emphasis on serving God and pleasing God. What's interesting about the city of Ephesus, we've talked about how it's a seaport, prosperous and yet spiritually dark and all the things that we've talked about the city of Ephesus 2,000 years ago. But something that might be interesting to you is that the high level of, of um, interest in sports of the Greek culture had, had obviously flowed into that whole region of the world. Even the Romans were, were big into contests, and, but most of theirs was blood sport. It wasn't the same as what the Greeks had. And so if you were to look and if you were to even pull up your Bible and take a look in the back and look at the maps or something online, what you would find is that the city of Ephesus was literally surrounded by gymnasiums all the way around the city. It's like a circle around the city were gymnasiums. What's interesting about gymnasiums is that they're not like just Gold's Gym or 24 Hour or some of these other places because they were more than just for physical fitness. It was indeed a gymnasium for physical fitness, but around the perimeters were teaching classes where they would teach about the arts and they would teach about music and finance and all of these different disciplines of life. And yet the physical part was at the center, these gymnasiums all around. So how many believe that on Super Bowl Sunday, the Apostle Paul was probably, if he was not in prison somewhere, if he was here right now, he would be either at the game. How many know he'd either be at the game or he'd he'd be watching today, it's, it's just true. He, and he would find some kind of spiritual you know, metaphor or picture for us to be able to identify with and uh, to be able to grow deeper and stronger. You know, my hope today is that Peyton Manning will go out with a great win and be wise enough to retire. That's kind of what I'm hoping, but um, you know, that's just one guy's opinion. So you're right here with me in, in Ephesians. We're in Ephesians chapter three. We're gonna pick up with verse 14. And these next few verses are some of the greatest verses to be able to really take to heart and, and drink deeply from and just continually remind ourselves of what the Apostle Paul has gone through, his love for these people, his heart that beats for them, and what he's communicating. Look what it says in verse 14. He says, for this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. Let's just stop there for a moment. I want you to, I want you to envision in your mind the Apostle Paul just pinning these words under the inspiration and the unction of the Holy Spirit. And his heart is just breaking for these people that he loves so much and he is chained to a, a Roman soldier while he's under house arrest. And he's pinning these words and what does he say? He said, for this reason, what is the reason? All the things that he just taught us in Ephesians chapter one and chapter two. And what does he say to us? He says, you know, I want you to know that no longer is there Jew and Gentile, but because of Jesus and his sacrifice at the cross, he broke down every wall, every barrier, and now we are one in Christ. There is no male or female, no Jew, no Gentile, but there is one in Christ Jesus. There is total equality in Jesus. And he talked about forgiveness and he talked about grace and he talked about the unsearchable riches of God's grace. And therefore, he says, I now kneel before the Father. You know, when was the last time that you knelt in prayer? When was the last time you got on your knees? I mean, it's one thing to pray and I, I love it. And I know God loves it when you pray. I always try to teach people when somebody says, would you pray for me? Don't say, yes, I will pray for you and then go separate ways. Say, yes, I will pray for you and I'll start right now. Let's pray right now. 
When somebody calls you on the phone and says, there's a big need in my life or in my family, would you pray for me? Don't just hang up the phone. You know, right there in that moment, seize the moment. Grab a hold of that faith and even the power of agreement and pray that prayer. But how long has it been since there was a moment where you knew you needed God's touch so great, when there was something that was on your heart, where you would even stop where you are and you would just say, let's just get on our knees and let's call on God. It happens often. Every week people come into my office and they come because they've got big needs in their lives. And there's times when they come into my office and I'm like, you know, I don't just have an instant answer for you. I don't have an instant solution for you. But I think we ought to just get down on our knees. And I think we ought to call on God right here. How many know there's something powerful that happens when out of a spirit of humility and a spirit of awe and reverence, you get on your knees and you do business with God? We want God to do business with us, don't we? We want him to stand up on our behalf. And we want him to rise up and be our mighty warrior, our redeeming king. We want him to come and do great and powerful things in our life. I want to say something to you. If you want the glory of God, the power of God, the breakthrough of God, then learn how to honor him. Learn how to revere him. Learn how to come before him. The apostle Paul says, for this reason. What is he saying? I want so much for you to get this into your heart. Stop living as a broken, divided people. Stop looking down your nose at other people. I want so much for you to know the grace of God. I want so much for you to know the forgiveness of Jesus. I want you to know so much what this kingdom is about, that on your behalf, I'm kneeling before the Father. Can you just see the, the, the tears just kind of flowing out of his face as he's there chained to a prisoner or to a, to under, as a prisoner chained to a guard in the city of Rome. And what is he doing? He's praying and he's interceding. And he's praying these prayers and he says this, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. I mean, who is more qualified to speak to us about the move of God in your life and in your inner being, in your core, than the Apostle Paul? A man who has all the things I've already said, shipwrecked, beaten, bloodied, left for dead, falsely imprisoned, all these things that have happened to him. And this is a man who had to know there's something more than putting on the front in front of other people and saying, hey, how's it going? It's going good, it's going great. You know, and all that aspect of, of what's on the surface. The apostle Paul understood something. When you are facing the trials and the tribulations and you're knee deep into this battle, you're gonna need something more than just what's a smile on the surface. You're gonna need a work that goes down deep into your core. When your marriage is struggling, when you're teetering, when you don't know what's happening with your kids, when you don't know if that job is gonna be there next week, there's something that needs to be a little bit more than, is it true or is it not? A little bit more than the surface. You need to know something deep inside of you. You need to know who you belong to, who's your source, who's your strength, who's the one that really rules and reigns, who's the one that brings the promotion, who's the one that rearranges the chairs, who is the one that's really in control? That place of just inner strength. And he says this, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is the love of God. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. Wow, can you see this man who's been through it all? who's not praying on his own behalf, but is just broken before the Lord and even writing these words and he's praying, and he's believing God, and he's asking the Lord to do something supernatural in the lives of these people that he loves so much and that the Lord would do something. He says, I pray that, that being rooted and established in love, I wanna ask you something. Are you seeking to be rooted and established in love? Today we're living in a culture and a day and a time where people look at spouses as interchangeable parts. In fact, we're living in a place and a time where people are so fed up with the idea of marriage. I mean, some of these kids have gone through a series of different step parents and different things, and they've just, you know, they've just disconnected. We're in a generation today that is just kind of, un, you know, just disconnected from the idea of marriage itself. And I'm saying this to you. You and I, we need to stop giving up the things that God has purposed for our lives because we've struggled 
And we need to connect ourselves to the things that really build lives, build families, build culture, build community. Is it true or is it not? And we need to quit being a culture of quitters and we need to be a culture of people who will lean in and say, Lord, we may have struggled, we may have failed, we may be broken, but you're the one that makes us whole. You're the one that puts our feet back upon the rock. You're the one that gives us a dream that we ought to live. And we ought to start to set bigger, higher standards instead of living to the lowest common denominator. We ought to really begin to sow the seeds that will bless our kids and give them a hope and a future instead of just having them cash out and us handing them a marijuana cigarette and telling them it's all good, just lower your expectations, numb yourself. If you watch the debates, you heard all over again about the heroin problem of of, uh, Vermont and yet people on the platforms advocating, you know, legalizing drugs in order to deal with the drug problem. I know it's confusing to people. I know they're tired. I know we're worn out. We're we're worn out with things that haven't worked in this culture. There's something that we ought to be awakened to, and that is what does work. And what does work is parents loving their children, taking their kids and teaching them the things of God, and modeling for them a life that is worth getting up for in the morning. Those are the things that work. That's where culture shifts. Am I I preaching? Where's the Gatorade? You know, you know, am I preaching truth to you today? We do not have to continue to live the way we're living. The message of Christ is a message of transformation. It is a message of hope no matter where you are. If you're in that place where you abase, well, you can start to dream for the moment when God begins to take you to a bound. You need to realize you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. You may have been raised in a broken place. You might have had poor role models, but that is no excuse for you to stay on that pathway because when you come to Christ, every life gets lifted. Every life gets changed. If you will call upon the Lord, if you will seek him and ask him, he will come into your life and he will change things. That's why it's important for us to not only repent of our sins, but to even be identified with Christ. That's what water baptism is. Water baptism is I identify I physically identify with the death of Jesus Christ as I go down under the water and I physically identify with the power that I've been raised from death to life just like Jesus was raised from death to life. I identify with his new life. I identify with his power. I identify with his authority. I identify with his love for me. The apostle Paul says, my prayer for you is that you would be able to grasp this. It's interesting verbiage, isn't it? He says, my hope and prayer for you is you could grasp this. And then he goes on and he says, it's stuff that you can't even know. It's unsearchable. It's beyond knowledge. Isn't that exactly what the Bible says? It says it surpasses, the love of God surpasses knowledge. So it's more than you could ever get a hold of or or fully understand, but the Apostle Paul says, even at that, my prayer for you is that you could grasp, you could just get a hold of a little piece of understanding how wide. Remember, some of you grew up in church and we sang that little song, how deep and wide, you know, that, but you know, so you could just kind of see how, how wide the love of God is, how high the love of God is, how deep the love of God is. The love of God is so deep that there's no person who is beyond God's grace. The love of God is so high, there's none of us that are too good for it. Is it true? The love of God that surpasses knowledge. I'm thankful for you being in church. You're the hope of this generation. You're the hope of this generation. For you to grasp these principles and then take it another step. Water baptism, what is it? A public identification of who you belong to. A public identification of the faith you choose to live. A public identification that I am not separated from Christ, but I am in Christ and he is in me. Pretty amazing, isn't it? In Matthew chapter three, Jesus came to be baptized by John. And John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. And, the, and, and John the Baptist was the only person at that time that had the full revelation that Jesus was not just a man, but the Son of God. And when Jesus came, in, in Matthew chapter three, you can read it, verse 13 and following. When, when Jesus came to be baptized by John, John said, who am I to baptize you? You should baptize me. And, and he knew that Jesus had never sinned, so why would Jesus need a baptism of repentance? 
Jesus was walking the road of complete dependence and submission unto the Father to model for you and me that even though he was sinless, there was no act of obedience or faith that he would hold back from God himself. Isn't that unbelievable? And he modeled for you and me that there, we should not be so proud that we would miss the power of our identification with Jesus. Is that powerful? Is that powerful? 